Hello, and welcome to another edition of From the Source. I'm Elizabeth Johnson, and today I'm thrilled to have as my special guest, Nassau County Legislator Richard Nicolello. Legislator Nicolello is the presiding officer of the Nassau County Legislature. He's the chair of the Rules Committee and vice chair of the Budget Review Committee. A lifelong resident of New Hyde Park, he has served several terms representing the 9th District, which includes New Hyde Park, Albertson, Mineola, East Williston, Garden City Park, Plandome, Plandome Heights, Roslyn Estates, Muncie Park, and Plandome Manor. Here to speak about what's going on is Richard Nicolello. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you for inviting me to join with you. I'm happy to be here. Well, we're so happy to have you. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been in, in um, this role for a number of years. How many terms have you been? I am f completing my 12th term in office. I've been there for 24 years. I was one of the original county legislators, we, which started in 1996. So I'm one of two that's remaining since uh, back then. And who was, who was there at the... The other one is Vincent Muscarella. He uh, oh. represents West Hempstead, Franklin Square, and some of the other areas. But the oh. two of us are the only originals that are left oh after my 24 goodness. years, yeah. So tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, you know, how did you get into politics? Um, I had an interest in politics, you know, dating back to when I was in college, you know, in law school. Um, so you know, I, I had, you studied uh, political science, right? Po Undergraduate yes, at St. John's. Political si science at St. John's, which was okay. really interesting uh, stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I went to law school, and uh, after law school, I, I obtained a position at the uh, town of North Hempstead, actually, deputy town uh, town attorney. Really? Uh, so I practiced there for a couple of years, and then went into a, a private law firm. But I was always interested in, in it, and. Uh, I was active in civic associations and local fraternal and charitable organizations. And what happened was in the mid-90s, they had transitioned from a board of supervisors, which had governed the county for decades, to a county legislature. So hmm. uh, it was approved by the voters, and the first election was 1995. So I was excited to, to, you know, to get in on the ground floor, you know, to, to help to create something that was brand new. So uh, I ran for office there back in 95, elected then and started January 1st, uh, 1996, a long time ago. Wow, not so long. <laughs> yeah, no, it feels like that. <laughs> but so, so you've seen government evolve a lot during that time, and uh, I'm sure that the powers have, have expanded. Is that true, or uh, just more? Yeah, I, I, I think you're probably right. I mean, I've seen changes over time, and I think evolve is the correct way to put it. It's nothing right. radical, no radical changes have happened. And, you know, I've seen, uh, you, know, you know, Democratic uh, county executives, Republican county executives. Uh, it's, what's happening now is kind of unique because uh, for the first time in probably 16, 17 years, we have a member of the county executive who is a member of one party and the majority in the legislature is, are members of the other. So we have a majority Republican. So for the last two years, we've been working with the majority in the legislature with the Democratic County Executive. And, and for the most part, it's been, uh, we've been very productive. You know, we've had our disagreements on some of the issues, but for the most part, it's been a cooperative uh, relationship to keep the county uh, in good stead. That's great. Yeah. And how, how are you working on, um, uh, because I know, I know you've worked together, you've reopened all of the precincts that had been closed, yeah. and that was actually under a Republican uh, uh, executive. And so now um, our police are back. Um, and actually, uh, I just had as my guest uh, last week uh, the new commanding officer of the 6th Precinct. Oh, that's great. Um, and he's thrilled. Uh, He's reported crime is down, but he also has said that they ha don't have any detectives assigned to the 6th Precinct. So I know that's important to you. So tell me, how, how, how is that being addressed? Uh, that, that is a, a part of a major issue which involves uh, the uh, detectives in, in Nassau County. And the 6th the, the, uh, the Precinct is reopened. Uh, there are, the the detec detectives are not yet housed there. Uh, and part of the reason for that is we have a shortage of detectives in the county, mm -hmm. and, and that shortage is growing more acute 
all the time be, um, because you have retirements and, and things. The issue is there was a, there was a glitch in their uh, contract in terms of their salaries. So for those police officers seeking to move on to become detectives, because of the way the salaries, salaries are structured, they actually will make less money as a detective. So that there is no incentive. So that they will get more, um, they will get more responsibilities, more burdens, less money. So, so the problem is we're having difficulty recruiting our police to go into the te detective ranks. In fact, they've had police that have joined the detective ranks and been promoted, so to speak, and who have actually jumped back into the police. So, and, and it's unfortunately it's been going on for a while. Uh, it is a, a tremendous issue here for the county because uh, detectives are so important for for so many issues, uh, right? Uh, f gang problems for you know internet crime, uh, you, you name it. Um, you know, uh, theft of uh, ident identity theft, etc. We need a fully staffed detective, uh, you know, bureau to, to deal with those issues. So, uh, does that come under um, whose jurisdiction to relook at the? either pay scale or the guidelines or, or compensation related to that. Now those, I, those, that's, those, are, those are negotiated items, so they're in, they're in contracts. Okay. Uh, and in fact, the contract with the detectives and all the major unions uh, uh, expired actually a couple of years ago. So they're in negotiations now. Um, uh, I don't know how quickly a resolution on the horizon. What I've advocated all along is that the um, that they, they separately negotiate this specific item with respect to the detectives and move on to the, all the rest of the items. Uh, okay. But I think they, this has to be addressed soon because it really is going to affect our quality of life. It's going to affect public safety if it not, has not done so already. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they do a f the detectives we have do a fabulous job, but you can only stretch them out so far. Absolutely. And, and, uh, especially, and especially with what's coming down from the state in terms of uh, cashless bail, the criminal justice reform. We're going to need more police uh, to deal with some of the ramifications of that. Can you speak about that? I was just reading about this cashless bail that is supposed to be rolled out, and I don't understand what that means. <laughs> well, it, it's with the exception of a, a very small um, area of crimes, basically violent crimes, and something called a major drug, drug trafficker, which is basically El Chapo. Every other crime, a judge is prohibited from setting bail when someone is arrested for those crimes. So oh. they, the, so not only can't, the, the, the judge simply cannot set bail for them. Um, they can establish restrictions, you know, monitoring by the probation department, et cetera, um, but it's, uh, it's, for all intents and purposes, uh, for the vast majority of people accused of crime, they will be back onto the streets and into the neighborhoods uh, as soon as they are arraigned. Uh, uh, for many of them, they'll simply get an appearance ticket, and the appearance ticket will say show up on court on Tuesday. And then when they don't, the court has, has an obligation under the law to make persistent efforts to, to obtain their, their cooperation before they can actually apprehend these individuals. So it's going to create tremendous challenges, and in fact, with the uh, budget that, we just, that was just adopted, we had made some changes uh, to, to to get proactive to try to deal with this. Uh, th there's going to be more burdens on the DA's office, so we amended the budget to put more staff into the DA's office. And the same thing with probation. There's going to be more obligations to monitor, to supervise individuals who are, you know, accused of crimes. Um, so we put more money into that. And we also created what's called an Office of Crime Victims Advocate. So, um, I mean, that's just part of it. I mean, there's, there's, we could do a whole show just on, on this cashless bail. It's, it's, it's a it's a major change in, in, in state government. Our uh, police commissioner says it's going to lead to increasing crime. It is going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars to comply with on a statewide basis. So why are they doing this? Why aren't, why aren't judges allowed to, uh, you know, assign bail? for whatever the uh, crime is. So, uh, you know, it, 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 as with everything government does, it comes out of a, a you know, it actually a, a good idea. For, for, the, for the minor offenses, right. you don't want to incarcerate someone for a very minor offense and leave them in jail um, because they have the inability to, to pay for, you know, a lawyer or any, rather the inability to pay for bail. So for those minor, minor offenses, absolutely, you, you'd want to have some sort of reform where they don't have to spend time in jail for something right. that's, that they're no threat to society. But unfortunately, they took it too far and they included too many offenses. Um, you know, again, it's a small 
narrow uh, uh, window of crimes that are excluded from this. Everybody else gets, you know, is, is not, it cannot be set, uh, included in jail and set bail for. Mm. So it sounds like uh, New York State has created another problem for us. <laughs> they, they absolutely have. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the, I think every DA in the state has raised concerns about it and the Attorney General. So it's, it's um, and, and most, unfortunately, most people are just not aware that this is, that this is coming. Um, so is this coming from the governor's office or is it coming from our legislature? It was passed by the state legislature as part of the budget. Okay. And, and unfortunately, when they do that in, in, in Albany, uh, there really is no debate or discussion on these things. They get included with this huge package, package. for the budget. Okay. And it sort of was put into that, and the next thing we knew, this was in, in place. It takes effect on January 1st, and it's been estimated that 300 of the inmates in our Nassau County Jail are going to be released as of January 1st. Yes, I, I just heard there was a big one that occurred in one of the states. Yeah. Indiana was yeah. uh, also had uh, released a number of inmates because of something similar to this. Yeah. But I don't, I, I'm amazed. I just think that's interesting that further discussion was not or, you know, thought yeah. put into this particular yeah. legislation. I mean, one of the other aspects that's troubling is that it, it has really tightened up the requirements on the DA's office to provide what's called discovery. So within 15 days of someone being arraigned, um, they ha the DA's office has to provide every bit of documentation that they have, you know, the statements obtained from the police, the police notes, charts, diagrams, photos, you name it. Um, all that evidence has to be turned over to the defendant's attorney. And the concern there is that if they don't get all of it over, that they could be looking at motions to throw out charges. So that's why we put more staff into the DA's office, because they are going to have to really scramble to get all of this together. Some of that information is going to be highly sensitive. You know, for example, contact information for victims and, and things of that nature. So it's, right. uh, which is why we're creating this office of crime victims advocates. So it's, it's, it's a major major pro uh, issue and a problem for, for going forward and we're pledged to do everything we can at the county level to, to uh, make sure that we do what we have to do to protect the citizens. Is the technology there in order for us to be able to provide that this information? I mean, obviously it comes from multiple sources. Right. It comes from the police, it comes from, you know, the DA's office itself, it comes from their uh, uh, individuals who are working on the case. Um, I mean, technology seems to run our world. So, and in this case, there's a time frame. I mean, I'm not sure whether the time frame is calendar days or is it, uh, you know, business days? Mm -hmm. Because I remember that was a tricky thing, right. especially coming. You know, my background is more like finance, so it's it's uh, you really look at, you know, you have to look things at. In, in a business perspective, and that that actually that distinction could help or yeah. hinder you uh, depending on what it is. It's good, very good, actually, very good point. And, and but um, I, I'm assuming it's it's just 15 calendar days. I don't I don't think it's business days. Um, mm -hmm. So, but you're right about technology. So that, that's actually a very good point. Also, so I, uh, on this coming week, we're going to be adopting uh, or passing a contract to provide uh, additional software services so there'll be more integration between the police. And, DA's office and all the rest. And you, with probation, you have obviously means to supervise people in their homes to make sure that they're there, but it's, that's, it's tremendously labor intensive. I mean, you can get all the technology in the world, but if there's not the human resources behind it, it's not going to be effective. So that's, again, that's why we put more p resources into probation. But I really believe this is, uh, this is only the beginning of the, type of, of the expenditures we're going to have to make and resources to deal with this. Yeah, definitely. That's a big challenge. Yeah. <laughs> sure is. Speaking of the budget, yeah, yeah. I um, understand that uh, you, as a vice chairman of the budget committee, um, I had put forth some changes that uh, wanted uh, <coughs> wanted to be included in yeah. this budget. Um, and it, you say that it's tentatively been approved? Um, well, we had amended the budget. First of all, the budget is $3.6 billion, billion with a B. Yeah. It's a, it's a tremendous uh, sorry. budget. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, you, didn't, you didn't say that. You didn't say oh, that. Okay. I, I think people just don't you know, conceive of how big this, you know, even it's like a, a county of our size could have a budget that big, but it is. 
it's huge. Um, so we made some amendments, and as I said, some of them were accepted. The probation increases the DA's office, crime victims advocate, but some were, were vetoed. Um, we wanted to put more money into, or more staff into the uh, fire marshal's office to, to hire more police medics. Uh, we wanted to put more staff into health department and consumer affairs to deal with vaping enforcement. Um, and you know, and a number of different measures. Uh, more staff in public works, and additional money for veterans. Those, unfortunately, were vetoed by the county executive, and we were not able to muster enough votes uh, to override the veto. So th those amendments did not pass. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll continue to, to push for those things. You know, things like the, the police medics. There is a shortage, and at some point they're going to come to Absolutely. us and ask for more members. And fire marshals are very important, also. And, and there's historically we're not anywhere near what we we have been in the past. So when you open a business, and this is important to your members in the chamber, Absolutely. or you want to open a business, you have to get the fire marshal to come in to check out the fire suppression systems, et cetera. And if, if there's not enough of them, there's delays involved. And you, you, you purchased or leased a, a storefront, you made the investment, and the building is sitting vacant until such time as the fire marshal can complete its investigation. So we wanted more resources into that, but unfortunately that's another area where it failed. Yeah, that's actually a chronic problem for our, our businesses. Yeah. And I can tell you that my merchants have been complaining about that. Um, it's taken numerous months, sometimes even a year, yeah. uh, to get the business up and running. Yeah. And they're paying rent and, you know, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, we want everyone to shop local and yeah. everything like that and somehow, it becomes a detriment it, it <laughs> when is. there's a lack of staffing, yeah. you know. It's right. It's in part due to, to that lack of staffing. Um, I mean, but we, we want the businesses job. to get open as soon as possible. They do a fabulous job, when, yeah. you know. But we want the businesses open as soon as possible. It's jobs. It's, it's uh, sales taxes. It's you know productive. It's a storefront that's being productive. So. So it's a, it's a, it's been an issue for a while. They've done a good job at reducing the backlog, but they still have work to do and they need staff, so that's why we wanted to do that. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so um, how do you find the businesses within Nassau County are doing? Um, I think we are doing very well. Uh, um, uh, I think our economy is, is flourishing. Uh, employment is at historic lows. It's, we're doing better than you know, the statewide averages. Um, it is a very difficult environment for businesses in, in Nassau County because of the, because they have to deal with so many layers of government, because of the taxes involved, the high cost of living, and cost, um, so you know the county does what it can to assist uh, many of these businesses get, to get started or to stay here. Mm -hmm. But overall, I think our economy is doing well. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're still losing many of our young people to other parts of the country, um, right. and I think it's. Um, I think it goes back to those things I just mentioned. You know, it's, it's so uh, I, I don't know how a young person can afford a house. I mean, you know, you know, I think your median house is of five, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars, and then up. So, so, uh, so it's difficult there. And you know, we have to do whatever we can to make sure that those young people stay here. You know, those millennials, are, they're well educated, they're, they're great resources they could be for our for our county. And our, they're our kids, we, you know, and grandkids, we want them here. Absolutely. Yeah. I know mine is actually out of the country because yeah. uh, <clears throat> couldn't afford it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I have my wife's sons in San Francisco working for an insurance company and my daughter just relo relocated to Atlanta. So it's, you know, I'm happy. in them. Atlanta too. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy for them. It's exciting, but you know, you'd rather have them close to you. Absolutely. Yeah. I definitely agree. Um, the reassessment. <clears throat> Talk to me about that. I know that you put a lot of things in place. Okay. Um, uh, I know that uh, initially it was put forth, you know, that we should be, uh, that the system is broken <laughs> and that people are being either charged too little or too much, yet we seem to be developing all over the place. I was just talking to your aide uh, about the, the strip between uh, the LIE and the uh, yeah. Northern State. Brand new, yeah. you know, I, I would think our taxes should go down because they're building <laughs> all so over much. the place. True enough. Um, so. so the system, I mean, the system was, uh, was broken. It was unfair. I mean, the, the, we had the values were not accurate anymore. Some people were paid too much, and some were paid too little. 
And we, in a Republican majority, we, we voted for the, uh, to, to give the county executive every tool that she asked for in terms of going forward. Um, so, you know, we were all on board in terms of getting this done to making more fair and equitable values. We just had disagreements as to how it was rolled out, uh, the way that they were communicating with people, even to this day, in terms of people who made challenges. Uh, so, uh, you know, so we had enormous difficulties with what the uh, assessor was administering it. So, so there were disagreements, and there still are disagreements going forward. But the bottom line is, is reassessment is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, the first tax bill that will be based on the new assessed values will be October of 2020. So that, that's coming. Next year. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and the only issue, I mean, there's a number of issues, but the major issue that's, that's on our agenda would be the, uh, uh, the phase-in. There was a phase-in proposed for people who's getting, who are getting increases uh, over five years. Um, so that, that will be voted on and, uh, and I believe will be approved well, be, well before October 2020 to give some relief to, for those of our residents whose taxes are going up substantially. So um, I understand also in uh, New York State, uh, Anna Kaplan had uh, p proposed a, a two percent cap per year that will, all, um, I guess, alleviate the uh, reassessment being hit right away. What happens when someone is assessed considerably more? that cannot be rolled in within five years? Um, the 2% will, will not help those people whose, value, whose taxes are changing because of reassessment. That just limits governments from raising taxes more than 2% in I a see. given year. But if your assessed value has changed and, you, and as a result you're going to see a 20, 30, or 40% increase, you're going to see that all at once. I mean, 2% is not going to help you. So that's the, uh, that's the idea be behind the phasing. And we had actually supported this uh, law in the, in the state that says that you're not allowed to go up more than 5% per year or 20% over six years. Uh, the county executive cho chose to avoid that law. And, um, and, and, but now, you know, obviously now the proposal is for 20% uh, per year over five year increase. Okay. Well, one of the things that Assemblyman Ra has proposed though is for those people whose taxes should be going down, who've been paying too much, he wants to develop a tax credit from the state so that they'll get a corresponding benefit. So, I mean, obviously the people whose taxes are going up will receive a benefit for a phase-in, but the people whose taxes should be going down should, should, you know, shouldn't have to bear the brunt of, of, of this delay in, in the reassessment. So, uh, I'm not sure, you know, we supported his measure and hopefully we'll, it'll see some, some support in Albany. Okay. Yeah. So let me ask you as a New Hyde Park resident, yep. are you going up or down? <laughs> um, I would be going down. Okay. Just for the simple reason that I never challenged my assessment. Really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, as, I, as a county official, I decided it wasn't something. I should not be in a position of challenging my own assessment since I'm already I'm one of the you know, legislators for the county. So. Okay. so since I never challenged my taxes or my assessment over the years, uh, I fall into the category of people whose assessment has probably been higher than it should be. Okay. So. I, I understood that like most of these incorporated villages really are rather accurate as far as their assessments yeah. and it's not too far off of what it should be. Um, is, is, do you get that same impression? Uh, I, I agree and I believe uh, that you know th that this is probably better done by villages and, and towns. Yes. Uh, I think the county is one of only two in the state that does this, the county wide. So when you are when you are evaluating 400 and something thousand properties, there, there's going to be errors, and there's going to be you know the, the margin of error is going to be greater. If you're evaluating a much smaller number of properties, the chances are you'll get it more accurate. So, I mean, it, it's been discussed for many years that perhaps it's better to have the towns do it, and I certainly think that would be a solution. But there's no appetite to do that in Albany, and I don't. I guarantee the towns don't want it. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants to touch assessment. <laughs> it is. It's a tricky. Yeah. It's a tricky topic. Um, you know, you are dealing with people who ha are established and have lived here a long time, mm -hmm. and perhaps now are widowed and no longer have you know the ability to um, you know update yeah. the houses. And it, it's just it's a tough. Tough topic, no, you know, don't really want yeah. to touch that with a 10 Yeah, <laughs> well, no, most people but. don't. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> one of the things is people can be property wealthy 
and lived here for many years and in fact not really have much liquid income so they're sitting on, exactly. a, on an asset that's you know in certain communities could be m over a million dollars but they don't necessarily they're not living like royalty that they're, they're simply getting by day by day so those people in particular who are seeing in large increases you know, we're concerned about them yeah it's, 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 well it's, and uh, and especially in those high value areas um, with the multi-million dollar um, yeah. Of course, some of them have multi, uh, double digit uh, or triple digit even uh, tax, taxes assessed yeah. with that. Um, I think it's going to change the face of Long Island. Um, maybe not necessarily in your area, right. um, but in others, definitely. Yeah. We're concerned about that. And, and we know that, especially the uh, higher end neighborhoods, um, I think that there are the market is not the real estate market's not what it had been and it's it's slowed uh, i think in the middle areas it's still doing very well but i think the higher end homes and i think assessment probably plays into that i'm sure it does as well as uh you know, the cap on deductions i'm sure that's, yeah. that's having an effect it was so. is kind of like a triple whammy yeah. when this was all rolled out yep. so Talk to me a little bit about uh, AIM, and I know that you went to, into an emergency session the, like a, uh, last week or so. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, the state, the governor had changed this, the AIM, which is, this is aid incentives to municipalities. Basically, it's, right. it's a state program that, that gives uh, monies to local municipalities. And, and, and your villages, your towns rely on these monies to provide the services. Um, so for most of these villages and towns, the governor decided that, that they will no longer be sending this money directly from the state. Instead, what they're doing is they're taking the money out of the, the county's sales tax, and they are using that money to, sub, to, to pay the villages this aim, these AIM monies. Um, but the problem with Nassau and Erie County, and I think there was another one, is that we're, we have a control board uh, in effect. And because the control board's here and because they initially, the sales taxes initially go through them. The controller raised an issue as to whether it, we could, you know, whether we could actually do it this way, whether the monies could come out of the sales tax. So uh, to resolve that, we reached an agreement with NIFA, with the control board, that will resolve the issue so that, in fact, the monies will, will be able to flow from the sales taxes that are due to the county to these local municipalities that, that do such a good job. So basically, you know, ultimately it was taking a pool of money going to the villages and towns uh, from out of, and, and from one source from the state, and now it's coming from county sales taxes. Yeah. Different source. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being my wow. guest today. 28 minutes already? <laughs> <laughs> that did go quickly. <laughs> and that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for watching From the Source. Tune in next time for more in-depth interviews with members from your community.